How's that? <coughs> Life has not been easy for you, Tim. And you know, the Lord has sent you here tonight because he has for you a divine appointment. And in the midst of it, I, I see you like a tree that in the growing up stage has been very broken, very wounded. And many of the wounds have not really healed properly, yet you have kept going on and you have kept growing and you have, uh, feel like the bark has grown over the wounds of your past. So in the name of Jesus, I bind the darkness that comes against you in Jesus' name. I come against the spirits of mind binding and the chains that have bound the way that you thought that have, that have injured you and hurt you. And I command every link of every chain be broken now in the name of Jesus. I command every lock to be undone and fall to the ground, never to return in Jesus' name. And I come against the spirit of accusation that sits upon you that is always attacking you, making you feel like you're not good enough, you won't measure up, uh, you'll never get it done, things will never change. And I uncover the lie of that because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The greater one lives inside you. And I declare freedom in Jesus' name. And I mark the entry points of your life with the blood of Jesus Christ. Every doorpost of your life I mark with his holy blood. And let the devil find no place in you. No unsettled claims against you. Because all have been settled by the blood of Jesus. Amen. We sang that song about burn the ships. That's uh, because uh, when Hernando Cortez uh, invaded Mexico, he was looking for gold and he had his half a dozen ships on the shore and he had, um, he had a couple of hundred men. He had horses that the Aztecs had never seen. The Aztecs literally had thousands of soldiers and I think from memories had less than 200. He had a, a few horses, they'd never seen those. But what he did was he lined his men up and he said, we'll burn the ships. Now, a lot of us are sitting there with ships floating in our backyard, we haven't burnt them yet. They're ready for our speedy getaway. They're ready for us to avoid responsibility to avoid the word of the Lord, to, av to avoid doing what we know we need to do, to avoid habits that are hard to break, bills that are hard to pay. People, uh, a lot of the ships we've got uh, unburned are people that we should be reconciled with and should be putting some effort into. I pray for all of you that you'll burn your ships that you'll set fire to them and you'll watch them burn to the ground. When Leanne was out the other night, she saw someone torch a stolen car. <laughs> so she, what you sort of do to that car, um, Leanne, you have to do the ships in your life. Okay. Craig and Heidi, there's been an assignment against you which has almost been like a cloud of smoke without any clear way of fighting, without any clear way of getting hold of it. But that changes tonight. And I see running down the lineage of your family like a, um, a snarling dog and an angel of the Lord comes out and puts a muzzle on it. And in the name of Jesus, I muzzle the things that would attack you from the past. And I refuse them entryway into your bloodlines anymore. I break every generational curse upon your family. I shatter it now and release the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. I've been meditating on uh, I've been meditating for a year on the seven places where Jesus shed his blood because if I were to say to you um, 
Uh, uh, if, I, if I was so the way that Jesus shed his blood, you'd say I'm Calvary. But he, and that's true, mm. and that's important. But he shed his blood in other places that made redemption total. And one of the first places he shed his blood was in the garden. And uh, I remember as a little boy, I, ha I had a big picture in my bedroom. I had two pictures. I had one of an angel leaning over a broken bridge to retrieve, to pick a flower when the bridge was all broken. I had that there. You still see them for sale in St Vincent de Paul every now and then, every now and again. Um, and then I had a photo of Jesus in the garden. And Jesus said in the in the in the first time we see in the Garden of Eden, Adam gave in, and Adam said, "My way, not your way." He was told by God, "Listen, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a victory. Uh, I'm giving you this world, but don't eat this fruit." He ate the fruit, and here we are. I hope it, I hope it wasn't even an ice apple, probably. But when Jesus was in the, in the garden, he said, "If there's any way to do this except this way." but your will, not mine, be done. And he sweated drops of blood. And it's a medical fact that if we get under stress or get tremendously bad news or get under pressure, then we can actually shed blood through the pores of our skin on our face. And that blood that was shed there indicates how much God wants to give us a mind that's peaceful. He shed his blood so that we can have a mind that doesn't need to shed blood. I think there are very few things worse than standing um, defeated by your own thoughts, defeated by your own mind, defeated by your own self-talk. Just put your hands on your forehead for me. I pray for the peace of God to fall upon you. May it be like a cap that you wear upon your head. The holy peace of God. I pray for every broken bit in your life that you would be healed I pray for the pain that you've had to face where you've run away from the pain where you in fact where you in fact broken off I pray that there'd be a homecoming over your life now that all broken bits would come home and you would be whole in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Let's take the elements of communion. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke the bread and he said to his friends, take this and eat, for this is my body which will be given up for you. Let's eat together. At 
the end of the meal, Jesus took a cup and filled it with wine. He said to his friends, take this and drink it because this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be given up for you and all humankind. Let's drink together. When I first came to the Lord, people spoke to me about a man, an Englishman called Smith Wigglesworth, and they say, uh, and he has a few books, he was called uh, Around the Place, he, he, he died in 1949, but he was called the Apostle of Faith, and his lifetime habit was to go to communion every single day of his life. And... Uh, he was a great miracle worker, he was an Englishman and one of the absolute Pentecostal pioneers. Um, communion demonstrates to us and demonstrates to the evil one the victory that we have in Jesus and reinforces it. Tonight's talk is called How's Your Sin News? I'm reminded of this talk, David, because we had a leg of lamb last night and I had the shank bone, which always has a sinew attached one way or the other. Reading from Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit and sent me down in the midst of the valley which was full of dry bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were many in an open valley and they were very, very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered him, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to thee, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I said, how are you going to do that? And the Lord said to him, I will lay sinews upon you and I'll bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am God. See, God does things in a divine order. See, it would have been a bit silly for God to create all, all, all fish and no water because they never would have made it. <laughs> and so... Uh, would have been our best chance to catch a few coal, I would think. Um, on day one, he divided the, the light from the darkness. Day two, he created atmospheric levels to protect the earth and create the possibility of life. And day three, dry land, grass, herbs, all the fruit trees and all the stuff we eat. Ezekiel 37, 6, And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that you are Lord. You can't know that he is and he is your Lord if you're not alive. If you go down to Lawson Cemetery, which is really badly kept, um, you won't find many people to witness to you down there. You can't, you can't be alive if you don't have breath and you can't have breath unless you have skin and unless skin, because skin covers and protects the flesh and includes all your organs and your muscles and the muscles are no good unless you have sinew. A sinew or a tendon is a cord that connects bone to bone, muscle to, bo muscle to bone. 
And if you tear a tendon and don't have it looked after, it will over time and not not years, it will atrophy and ball up into itself and you will never get function back to that area. So where 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 tendons tend to sort of hold us all together. Tendons are like ligaments and they're both made of collagen and ligaments from join one bone to bone and while tendons connect the muscle to the bone for a proper functioning of your body. Remember when Jacob wrestled the angel and the angel touched his hip and his hip went out of joint? The Jews to this day will not eat the tendon from the hip bone out of respect for Jacob. The tendon near the hip socket, because of what happened with Jacob's hip, sinew is the tendons of any mammal. Tendons are tough, uh, stringy things that attach to muscles and bones. And when these tendons are processed, they make wonderful material that can be used to make rope. And all sorts of cordage, good sewing thread. And they can be used as a binding to attach arrowheads and axe heads and arrow flexions and knife handles and spear points and drill points and arrowheads. Sinuous is, um, sinuous is tough as nylon and it, it's impregnated with its own natural, natural glue. And so when you wrap an arrowhead to a shaft with a sinew and let it dry, it dries solid and hard and keeps the arrowhead at it. Sinew will last for hundreds of years. It's a super material and it has no modern equivalent. The definition of sinew is tendon. And, you know, we probably, all football followers here know a lot about tendons because our favourite players get tendonitis. They get syndonitis. They get a torn tendon. They get a ruptured tendon. They get everything going wrong with them. Like one of the things they'll do is they'll pe they'll Pull, they'll pull a bicep tendon, which means they can't use the arm properly for a year. And those of us who follow football, um, tendons have become important to us because of what they do to our favourite players. We can build up our muscles and we can build, take vitamin D, either by injection or tablet, to, to strengthen our bones. But all the strength of the muscle and all the strength of the bone counts for nothing unless there's a, if a tendon tears away from it. Scripture says we're all members of the body of Christ. But the body won't, doesn't move, our body doesn't move without tendons. In fact, it looks and performs in a deformed way. Muscles will ball up, they, we can't even raise an arm. The longer you wait to have it repaired, the less likely it will be that it will be repaired safely. Scar tissue. See, David said to God, Give me, a give me a fleshly heart, one that isn't all scarred up. Soft, appliable heart. They reattach a tendon by screwing.
screwing some an anchor point into the bone and that's how they reattach it. Ezekiel mentions a valley of dry bones of everything the bodies were made of, muscles, flesh, you name it, all that was left were bones. Of course, bones are hard. And that's why everything else that's on our body wastes away, but the bones will be there years and years later. The hard stuff. The rock. Jesus Christ. If you've got some hard stuff in your life, you've got something to connect to. If you burn the ships, you'll harden up. And we have to face some things in our life. I know many of, many of your struggles here and a lot of you have had to overcome some pretty tough things. Some of you are in the process of still overcoming them. The rock is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how strong the muscle or how the bone is, it needs a tendon to connect it all together. If a tendon is torn away, neither the muscle nor the bone has any use to help the body function. In fact, the muscle will begin to shrink if it's not reattached, if it's not reattached, then the sooner the better. You need to understand that the clock of your life is ticking and how God wants to use your life for his divine purpose. Your life uh, is being diminished every day you put him off. Every day you say, I'll do it tomorrow or I'll burn my ships next week. We get diminished. We atrophy as people. One Corinthians twelve. The way God designed our bodies was is a model for understanding that lives together as a church. Every part dependent on the other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, the other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, the other part enters into the exuberance of the healing. You know, it's like if we get a decent splinter in our skin, we get a, a splinter in our finger. Um, sometimes they're so small we can't even see them, yet they hurt. If you get an ingrown toenail, it's not something that you can just, you can just ignore. So a little thing in our body can affect, affect, affects the whole body. If you're Christ's body, and that's who we are, we must never forget it. Only as you accept your part of the body, does your part mean anything? You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in his church, which is his body, apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organisers, and those who pray in tongues. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Message Bible, it says, it's obvious by now, isn't it, that Christ's church is a complete body. It's not, it's not a gigantic, unidimensional part. It's not all apostle, it's not all prophet, it's not all miracle workers. It's a combination of all those things working together as one body. Working as it says in 1 Corinthians 13 in the way of love, it's the way of love. If I speak with the eloquence 
eloquence of angelic ecstasy and don't love, I have nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. Over the years I've had several people come to me over the years and say, I want to tell you this in love. You invariably know it's not going to be in love when they tell you it's going to be in love because if they have to qualify it, you know, whatever's coming, you're not going to like it necessarily. And I've had people come and speak to me in love and not having to say to me it's in love because I can tell and I can tell by my response, whether it even be conviction, whether it be uh, uh, exhortation or whatever it is, you know in love is doing a job on you. If I give everything to the poor, even if I go to the state to be burnt as a martyr and don't have love, I've got nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't, um, love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Love doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. Love doesn't mean I fly off the handle. Love doesn't mean I keep score of the sins of others. It, does, it doesn't revel when others are groveling. <coughs> Takes no pleasure in... in um, takes no, puts up with everything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. See, that's a good question to ask you. How do you think you're going on the love scale? <laughs> some of those, some of those, from my point of view, look pretty hard to leap over. And I know that I can't do it without God. How are you when you're at your job? How are you at your, when you're at home with your families? How are you when your Uncle Freddie calls? One John four in the Message Bible says, "Oh my beloved friends, let us continue to love each other, since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God." The person who refuses love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. And how can you know him if you don't love? He that doesn't love doesn't know God for God is love. See, love's the tendon. God's the bone. Something solid. Love is the tendon that connects us. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed, him, followed them and the rock was Christ. When a tendon's torn from a bone, it balls up and looks deformed. It's useless and begins to shrink. That muscle that is the will and purpose of God for your life is balled up and deformed looking and active because it's not attached to the bone. The tendon doesn't pull away from the muscle, it pulls away from the bone. You may come to church and put on your Christian smile. He that doesn't love doesn't know God. Do you have love for other people? How's your personal prayer life? See, you can say you love God, you never say a prayer, you've got to ask yourself how much do you love him? It's by consistent, considered prayer and alone time with God that you grow in him. Because in that time, he reveals his heart to you 
and you reveal your heart to him. In the time we enter union and communion with him and in that place we find peace and power. It's generosity to his kingdom. In this situation we find ourselves living in when we see the amounts of violence that's in our world. When we see that God, God's people, the Jewish people, are being afflicted and terrorised and insulted. When we see that, we should feel like we should write a cheque somewhere. When we see, I saw an ad today um, for a charity and it, uh, it had a hovel of a room and the, it said, why um, should girls have to sleep here when it's not the place of their sleep but their place of work? And we've got to say to ourselves, that's not acceptable to us. When we find that the government has a crackdown and arrests 500 domestic violence uh, people over a weekend, you've got to say to yourself, that's not acceptable to us. These are burn the ship moments. These are moments where we need to do something. How are, how are your sinews going today? How's your connection to him? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? I serve God because I love him. I felt that I have felt deeply, madly and truly in love with him. And I didn't start off loving him, but as I knew him and as I saw how he has treated me and my family over the years, I've fallen deeply in love with him. The Bible tells us that we love because he first loves us. Our love is a response to his love. If you're looking for love, look in the right places. Look within the pages of the Bible. Look, within, look, look for love within the arms and the words of friends. Go to church. Help others go to church. Be kind and generous with your money and your time. Because ultimately your God will be where you spend your time and your money. Lord, we, we, um, we just pray now for all who are here. We pray that you'd strengthen and encourage them. We pray any lost sinews in their lives would be attached to the bone, which is you. You do a divine reattachment job. I pray you know his nearness. As you draw near to him, he sure will draw near to you. Amen.